Let's get into it today. There's a lot to get to. As a family, a family unit, you know, it sometimes it's hard to ever think about tomorrow. We spend a lot of time thinking about the present today. If you got people in the house other than you living with you, it can get real crazy real fast, can't it? You got to deal with all the pressures of your own work, your own job, your own responsibilities. And then if you're married, you got uh, their work, their job, their responsibilities. And then if you have kids, well, just forget about it. <laughs> There's a lot uh, that comes with kids. You got school lunches, you got after school stuff, and then you got fights that they get in that you have to deal with and everything in between. It gets real crazy real quick. And each day can seem like a, a battle in and of itself. It can be tough. Life as a family can be draining and insanely busy. And life as a family, especially an adult in a family, can be exhausting sometimes. There's this old saying, though, when you're in a family, the days are long and the years are short, right? The days are really, really long sometimes, no doubt about it. But those of you who have older kids or grandkids, nieces, nephews that have grown up way too quickly... I've heard all of you uh, say to me at one point or another, how to go by so quickly, right? I blinked and they were grown up. Something to that uh, extent, now that you're looking back on it. So as we continue in this uh, series, Blueprints, Family Blueprints, we're looking at the life of a family through the lens of Scripture, trying to see what wisdom God wants to impart to us uh, with all the craziness that we're experiencing Today we're talking about the importance of building a family that can lift its head above the whirlwind, the craziness of life, uh, and look just a bit to the future, because I think we find peace in that. So we're going to talk about what it means to be a family that's future-focused, to be a family that lives not just trying to survive the day, but a family that lives with the end in mind. So when that day comes where you've blinked, Everybody's grown up. They're all out of the house. Life is profoundly different than it used to be. When you reach that moment, when you arrive at that place, you like the place that you have arrived. So here's the first thing that I want us to remember, that this is how God, the father of all of us, how he treats his children, okay? How he parents each and every one of us. He leads his family with a future focus. God leads his family, the church, with the end in mind, you see this throughout the Christian story and throughout the scriptures. From the moment that we're made, God is talking about the ending. You see, we messed everything up, right? We, we bring sin into the world. Everything gets all messed up. Our relationship with God, our relationship with others, is everything is now corrupted and corroding. And God immediately starts to speak about an ending. In Genesis, the first chapter of the Bible, it speaks about an ending, how God is going to fix everything that's been broken. And in the very beginning, he's lifting our eyes to that future. He's already talking about the ending and how he's going to make all things brand new, all things good, all things are going to be fixed. And then, of course, what does he do? He creates a people for himself. And he's telling them all the time about the future, how he's going to fix it, and the promises of what's to come. And then he does a crazy thing. He inserts himself physically into the story, doesn't he? Jesus, Son of God, fully God, fully man, enters the story, and through his life, death, in resurrection, Jesus secures the ending for you and for me. He secures the ending where we are all with God forever in a perfect peace and a perfect joy. So why does God spend so much time talking about the end of all things? Well, I think there's two reasons that he does this. Why he leads his family in this way. Why he's always future focused and why he's talking about the way things will be in the end. He does this because it's going to be a lot better than today. And he wants us to know that as bad as things can seem or be in your life, right, the end is going to be a lot better. We're going to spend a lot of time with him in that ending than we do right now in the middle, right, in his actual presence, face to face. He talks a lot about it because it's a lot better and it's a lot longer and as I was thinking about that this week, I think it's really, really instructive for parents and families of faith. If you have kids in your care, it may be hard to believe, but at some point, maybe when they're 18, 19, 20, 25, 30, they're going to leave the house, right, parents? That's the hope. Yeah. At some point, once they leave your house, once they leave your care, they will spend more time outside of your home and out from under your control than they ever spent in your home and under your control. There will come a day where you spend more time if you're married as a married couple without kids in the house than you ever spent with kids in the house. Hard for me to imagine that right now, right? 
In those days, when the kids are grown and everybody's doing their own thing and in their own place, those days actually have the potential, God says, to be some of the best days. The future will last longer and it should actually be better. Now, that's not to say that sometimes life doesn't work out that way and that there's not an incredible tragic loss and heartache in this life as well. There is. Sin brought that into the world. I'm not even trying to say that life as a family with everybody in the house, with all the chaos and the craziness, isn't amazing and a blessing in its own right. And we shouldn't overlook it because it does go by fast. All of that is true. It's incredible. But the ending lasts longer and is supposed to be incredible in its own right as well. And so wouldn't it make sense if we're a family and if we're hoping to have a family, if we're building our family right now, we're trying to help guide our son or daughter, whoever it is, that we would do what God has done knowing what the future to come is, what it's going to be like, that it's going to last longer and can be better. That we would do things today that would help ensure that, that future tomorrow. Wouldn't we be focused on making choices in our home right now that have an effect and an impact on that future tomorrow? That we would be future focused because it can be better and it can last. So what we're going to do today is talk about how we do that, right? What do we do today to influence that tomorrow? Where we lift our heads above the craziness of the moment to think about what are we building as a family? You know, God is always looking forward, so there's part of our lives, lives as we build our families that should look forward as well. And if you're tracking with me, you might ask yourself, okay, Stephen, but I need more detail. When you say that, that God is looking towards the future and we should be looking towards the future because it's going to last longer and be better, I need more from you this morning. I need to know exactly what I might be trying to build and what it can look like. If that's where you're at this morning, if that's what you're asking, well, first, excellent questions. <laughs> right? I like how you think. And for the answer, we go to God. If our lives are influenced by his life and his love over us, we need to look at the future that God is building, that God has promised, that he secured for us. And the clearest picture we get of the ending of the future of this family, of this family of faith is in the book of Revelation, Revelation 21. And this vision is given to John, okay? It's the same guy who wrote the gospel of John, uh, of what things are going to be like in the very end and uh, when the future is the present. And what he says is, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. So in the very end, God has re recreated all things, a new heaven, a new earth. He's gathered his family, his people around him. We enjoy each other's presence, enjoy being in his presence. We enjoy his influence. He's still our God. He's still leading us. We are still his children. We enjoy being with one another because we are remade, recreated, resurrected. And so we are fully ourselves, yet we are still in beautiful relationship with God. And we welcome his influence as our father and uh, in our lives as we enjoy being with him. And it's a really, really good thing. So yes, in that verse, we hear that there's a new world, new heavens, new earth. And a lot of times I think we're tempted to think that that's the prize. That's the focus. The thing that God wants for us to really be seeing in that, that verse, I believe, and hoping for, and drawing our eyes to is the fact that in the future, it's all about a relationship with him where we are in his presence. That is the beautiful part of this future, being in his presence. Everything else is just gravy on top, right? It's just blessing upon blessing that God gives us. The real prize is what Jesus won for you, is being with him. It's about us being able to still be together as a family and enjoying one another, but especially his presence and welcoming his influence in our life. So as I was praying about this this, this week and thinking on it, I just felt God nudging me that this is what the future of our families should also look like as well. So let me kind of explain what I mean here. Very often in families, when we think about the future, if we ever grab a minute, right, to think about the future at all, sometimes our minds are taken to some superficial successes. Not saying they're not important, but we tend to think about the amount of money we need for retirement. All the places we might want to go after the kids are, are out of the house. We think about getting them into the right school, getting them into the right job, uh, helping them marry the right person. We think about the number of kids they're going to have, the grandkids that will get to babysit, right? We think about those things. Those, those are not bad things at all. 
but they're also not the main thing. Again, if what we hear from Scripture is any indication, those are all incredible things, those are blessings, but the primary blessing in the future with God is this relationship as family that remains. This joyful presence of being with one another that remains. And this influence of a father, our father, right, of a whole family that's still welcome, that's still seen as a positive thing, it remains. That should be the goal for us. I think we should look to a future where once the kids are grown, they still want to come back, not as a have to, but as a get to. They get to enjoy you. So even if family is scattered all over the place, the family still wants to gather and we genuinely enjoy one another's presence. And kids are still welcome in their parents' influence in their life. We're getting together again. It's not a have to, but a get to. Where parents and grandparents get to enjoy relationships of those that are their grandchildren and their children. Not so much just as grandchildren and children anymore, but eventually, honestly, as friends. Not saying that parent side goes away, but it does shift a little bit, doesn't it? Sure, you love them more maybe than a friend, but you get to enjoy them in that way. And where the wisdom of parents and grandparents is not pushed away and eyes are not rolled, but where it's actually welcomed because we know it comes from love and there's influence and wisdom that is welcomed. That's the picture I believe God wants us to have for our families years from now. It's people still gathering together, everyone enjoying one another's presence and influence. I think that's why God wants us to have it is because of this peace and this love and this satisfaction that, that comes from it. That's the picture of all things in the end that God gives us. And I think it's a beautiful picture for us to aim for in our families in the here and now. Now, the question is, how do we get there? It's not just enough to talk about this future where we want everybody to get together and we genuinely enjoy one another's presence and we welcome one another's influence genuinely. How do we get there? Well, there's a couple things that we need to keep in mind, but I want to just reiterate the importance of talking about this because one of the things that I've seen in my own family and and, in numerous families that I've worked with in in ministry is that very often what happens is that once the family, that nuclear family matures and children leave the home, they establish their own homes and the marriages mature, right? What tends to happen is there can be a fracturing that takes place. The family's still intact, but because the future where the relationship isn't celebrated and people want to return to one another and the influence of parent to child and child to parent is still welcome, because that future has not been worked for or articulated, there is a disconnect between parent and grown child and even between spouses where relationships can kind of be held at arm's length, where influence of parent to child can be unwelcomed where there's unspoken friction or where a husband and wife who have made the children uh, the center of their universe around which everything revolves, once the children have left, that gravitational pull of their universe has disappeared and they don't know who they are in relationship to one another anymore. All kinds of fracturing can take place. Every family, I would say, has had something like that happen. All kinds of fracturing take place. Distance between father and mother, children, Spouses. And this is why it's a really important conversation to have. And it's important to see what God says about it. No matter what's happened thus far into your life, no matter what kind of fracture there have been, God can bring reconciliation. I know sometimes it seems like we just say that. But we have to believe it as people of God that he can bring reconciliation and be open to see how he wants to do that in our relationships. So how do we avoid the fracturing? I think it comes down to primarily one big thing that Paul talks about in two places in the New Testament. First place is in Ephesians 6. He says, fathers, mothers included here, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Those words, provoke your child, is actually one word in the original language. It can also be translated as exasperate, right? To exasperate someone to the point to where you push them away. Saying, fathers, mothers, do not exasperate your children to the point of anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. In the first week of this series, I mentioned how there was only maybe a handful, like less than half a dozen explicit commands given to parents in the Christian scriptures about how to raise their kids. This is one of them. 
So I think it's really important that we, we talk about it. In fact, it's so important that Paul says it again in Colossians. He says, more than once, fathers and mothers do not exasperate your children. And the implication in these verses is that there is a way to live in your home and to raise your children or to raise any child that's under your influence, be it a niece, a nephew, that you have a great relationship with, a grandchild that you spend a lot of time with, or anyone who is younger than you that's in your care. There's a way to love them and lead them in a way that actually crushes their spirit. And pushes them away. There's a way with good intention but poor results that actually spur up and create anger in the heart of a young person and create bitterness that pushes them away. Now, when I say child having bitterness or anger, I'm not talking about a typical toddler tantrum. Those are going to happen. I'm not even talking about the usual teenage rebellion. What Paul talks about is an anger and a deep discouragement where you attempt to lead them in such a way in your home that it stirs a desire to leave you and not return. Or if they do return, they want to hold you at a distance and be very wary of your influence. And some of us have experienced relationships with parents or grandparents, aunts, uncles, even bosses and teachers who have done exactly this. They have exasperated us through uh, though we love them, we don't really want to return to them or be near to them or be overly influenced by them. We want space from them. That's what he's talking about, and that's what we want to avoid. So again, needing more, what does it look like to exasperate your kids? Tell me what that looks like, right? Well, getting more out of Scripture, I think it comes down to three things that can lead to exasperating the young people in our life to a point that stirs up this bitterness and this anger that pushes them away. It comes down to these three things. When a parent or a person of influence is overbearing, when they are deeply unhealthy, or quite simply, if they are always impatient. They're overbearing, they're unhealthy, they're impatient. Now, I know those are broad, so I'm going to double-click on each one of those and kind of zoom in here, and uh, we'll talk about it. But look, no parent wants to be dominating, right? A depressing influence in the life of their kid. I don't think any parent wakes up and is like, get up, son or daughter, it's time to ruin a life, right? I don't think that's what we do. We love our families. We love our nieces and nephews, grandchildren, sons and daughters. We love them. It's because we love them that we want so much for them and so much from them. We want them to achieve this, to be that, to do this, to believe what we want so bad that we end up doing is we telling them all the time very intensely what we want from them and what we need from them and what we expect of them. And as I said two weeks ago, it's really, really good to paint a picture of who they're supposed to be. But there's a fine line between between painting a compelling picture for the future of who they're supposed to be and being a dominating, domineering force over their life where you are constantly with every little thing, giving them advice, admonishing, uh, correcting, disciplining all the time, hovering over them like a dark cloud that just wants to push them into the ground. That is what overbearing looks like. And the worst thing is it can be motivated by love. Again, I'm preaching something that I need to hear as well. I get that we want our children to become a certain person. But you can't control who they become. Some of us parents, we really need to absorb that truth. You cannot control who they become. I heard this quote this week, and I like it to a certain extent, but it said, you can't protect your kids from their testimony. Think about that one. You cannot protect your kids from their testimony. There's ups and downs in life. A lot of downs sometimes. They're going to go through struggles. You're not always going to be able to protect them or be by their side. But what you do find hope and rest in is that God loves them even more than you do and that he's always working in their life. You get to be a reminder of that love and that whatever they've done, God can turn it for good. He can use it as part of a testimony because I guarantee you somebody else in this life has gone through something similar. And to know that there's grace and forgiveness in those moments is one of the greatest testimonies that we could ever give. We cannot protect our kids from their testimony. We can influence it, and God definitely calls us to be an influence in our kid's life, but we cannot control it. And some of us have parents we've known Uh, since we're we're grown now, who are still trying to have that control of who we become. Parents and grandparents, aunts, uncles, we cannot control the little ones in our life, who they become. 
You can influence it. And the primary way in which you influence it is not with every little piece of advice that you give. It's with every little thing that you do because, again, kids are always watching. That's why our vision here is living a life that begs the question. That's why we live it out by valuing people and influencing where we go and living generously with all that we have because God, he works through all those things. They're always watching. See, it's not even so much with the words that we say. And words are important, right? Words are definitely important, but it's with the way that we live. I was at a recent uh, children's conference uh, where I heard this next part, and one of the presenters said it, and it kind of just cut me to the core. Uh, So I want to share it with you. Uh, Your children will not become who you tell them to become. They will trend towards who you show them you are. She said that children have always struggled to listen to their parents going back to the Bible. You can go back and read almost any story you want about family and dynamics between father and son besides Jesus, right, in the Bible. And there's always this friction. There's some disobedience that happens. So it's always existed. But what she said is that they've never failed to imitate their parents. If you want to influence the life of a young person, do less telling and do more showing. Secondly, our unhealth. It can exasperate the young people in our lives. And look, by virtue of being human, we are a mess. That is a fact. I am a mess. You are a mess. I like working a lot with premarital couples and engaged couples who are getting ready to walk down the aisle to become husband and wife. And one of the things that I tell every engaged couple that I work with is that there's only one thing that you can know for certain going into this marriage. And I get their attention. They lean forward. And I say, only thing that you can know and count on, is that you are marrying the worst sinner. Really romantic, I know, to be able to share that with them. And I say, if you don't believe me, come back after two weeks, two months, two years, and we'll have this conversation again. Because look, married life, family life, especially once you add kids into the equation, it reveals all of your sinfulness, all of your brokenness, all of your baggage. When you especially inject children into the mix, it will reveal your fears, your anxieties, your insecurities, and your anger. It will reveal those things and it will push all those things on you. And the temptation for many parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and leaders uh, of other people in general is then to work out their wounds on the people under their influence and convince themselves that they're loving them. That they're helping them, correcting them, disciplining them. When in reality, what you're doing is you're dealing with your fear and your anger and your anxiety and your insecurity at their expense. And if a child feels like they're being the whipping post for your wounds, they're not going to want to return. One of the greatest gifts a parent or a person of influence can give to someone under their care is to ask themselves this question as they live in relationship with that person that they love. As you interact with them and you discipline them and you correct them or give them words of advice and encouragement, ask yourself this question. Is it about my own wounds? Or is it about what's best for them? Is this about what's wrong with me or what they really need? Ask that question and in your own unhealth, it will be less of a hindrance in your relationships. And then the third thing is just plain old impatience. Man, am I guilty of this. Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 13 about the love that God shows to us and how he longs to have this kind of love flow through us to other people. In those famous wedding verses in 1 Corinthians 13, it's known as the love chapter. In those famous wedding verses, he describes love this way. The first way that he, he describes love is that phrase, love is patient, right? Love is patient and love is kind. So I'm going to give you an image that I found helpful of what patience actually is. You know what patience is? I encourage you to write this one down. Patience is a willingness to be slowed down by somebody else so that you can walk at their pace and be in their presence. That's patience. So much of family life is telling everybody else to hurry up. It is. I have two kids, seven-year-old son and four-year-old daughter, and most of my life, it feels like, is asking, why have we not left yet? Like, why are we not in the car? Why are you crying again to my four-year-old daughter? Like, she cries at everything. Like, there's no reason to be crying right now. To my son, why is the TV so loud? Why can't I hear it in my room upstairs? Turn it down. 
So much of family life is trying to get everybody to hurry up because, man, we have places to go, we have things to do, and we have people to be with. You got school to get them to. And if we're not careful, all that our children hear is that they cannot catch up. They can never quite step it up to your satisfaction. They can never quite be enough for all the busyness that we consume our life with. And if a child grows up or a spouse in a relationship with another spouse, spouse where uh, it never seems like they're, they're measuring up, where they are never doing enough, and they always feel a step behind, that's not someone they're going to want to return to very often. And so as parents, we need to remember as people of influence in general, you have to remember that the best influence and instruction in the life of somebody else, it often starts as an interruption. The best moments of influence and instruction begin as interruptions. The mistake they make that you wish they hadn't had made. The question they ask that you really don't have time to, to answer or for them to ask. The issue that emerges that you didn't plan for. It's how you respond to that in those moments. Do you stop? Do you slow your pace to walk with them? Do you, do you match their stride so that you can answer the question and respond with mercy and show them grace and be present in the mo moment with them? Because that's where the transformative experiences happen. Children don't naturally have as long of a stride as we do, right? That's just literal, but it's also figuratively as well. If you want to have an impact and power in their life, you have to be patient. And again, what does patience mean? It means slowing to the walk at their speed of the person that you love, because you know if you slow down to that walk at their speed, you can influence, that you can be with them and you can transform them. Patience is everything. And just a reminder to all of us here today, God is patient with each and every one of you. That's love. He's not overbearing with us. He's not impatient with us. And he's not working out his issues on us. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. What a wonderful God. Whole reason why he probably has not come back yet is because he desires for every child of his, every person in this world, to know of their Savior Jesus. He's being patient with us. Psalm 86 says, But you, Lord, are compassionate and gracious, God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Slow to anger. I'm so thankful for that one as well. There's a word in the Old Testament that's used over 250 times. It's a Hebrew word. We talked about it last month here in our Redefine series. Uh, but it's, it's a word that means the steadfast love of the Lord, an unrelenting, incredibly patient kind of love, right? Over 250 times. And that word is hesed. It describes the character of God, the love of God, who he is. And then, of course, who is Jesus? Jesus is that hesed, that steadfast, patient, always merciful love of God made flesh to us in order to secure our future for us. And so when we look at Jesus, we know that God is not going to exasperate us by being domineering and overbearing to us because Jesus says in Matthew 11, verse 30, he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I love that analogy, but I never thought about it in this context till this week. You know what a yoke is, right? You put two animals in a yoke, usually an older experienced one, then you have a younger one. And the older one teaches the other one how to kind of do the work, how to walk in the, the strides, to, to stay going the same direction, right? How many times in that yoke, if that yoke is meant for you and me and with Christ, are we pulling off to the other side? Are we stumbling over our own feet? Are we saying, no, I think I know this way to be better, right? Think of how many times Jesus has been patient with you in your life. That's the patience he wants us to show. When we look at Jesus, we know that God is not working out his issues on us. He's not punishing us because he's angry. He's not doing anything like that. He's given us nothing but mercy and grace uh, to us because he loves us. And every time he works in your life, he's working for your eternal good to be with him forever. Now, that's not saying that we don't go through really tough patches, right? And tough seasons. But even in those tough seasons, God is drawing us closer to him. He's trying to reveal something about his character to us. He's trying to show us how to rely upon him and that his faithfulness is going to be there for us each and every time. We know that when we look at Jesus, he always has our best interest in mind. And oh my goodness, is he patient. 
Every time you interrupt God's great plans with your mistakes and your sins and your struggles, does Jesus look at you and go, we should have been in the car already, <laughs> right? We should have handled this already. No, what does he do? He slows to your pace and he meets you exactly where you're at. I imagine him saying to us, looking us in the eye and saying, tell me, tell me what you're going through. I'm here, I'm listening. And remember, I love you and I forgive you and I hear you. He wants to walk with us. That's how God loves us in Jesus. And as we grow in that and as we show that kind of love to the people, as he uses that love through us, let us not exasperate and push away. Let us love like Jesus and draw people close. It's so easy in modern families to just kind of get caught up in the whirlwind and the craziness of today and make the aim of getting through a typical Tuesday, right? At the end of the day, you just want to say, I want the kids in bed. I want some wine in my glass. I want Ted Lasso on TV. Is that too much to ask? I get it. That's a real temptation. Being in family is hard. You know, <laughs> our kids go through so many different phases. Relationships go through so many different phases, don't they? I think the challenge for us is to be here for those phases, not to try to rush through them. As hard as they may be, to be here for it, to be present for it, to walk alongside. We only get a certain amount of time, and that time makes a huge impact. That's why we do everything that we do here, from our kids all the way up through our adults. Our time is short on this side, and we have to make it count. Being in family can be hard. Some days nobody sleeps. Some days everybody's sick. <laughs> Something's broken. But that's life in a family, and that's life with kids. And yet what people of faith, what we're called to do is lift our eyes above the craziness of every single day, look towards this glorious future that God has, a future where we get to return into his presence and to enjoy it, where we're still joyfully under his influence, and then he gives that picture to us as well to aim for and to strive for in our life. Where there are moments and days ahead where you want to return to one another, not as a have to, but a want to. Where people still welcome your influence over your life. Aim for that and pray for that. I'll leave you with something to think about over the course of this coming week. If you're here and you have a family or people under your influence, I have three questions that I want you to consider. Okay, these three questions are this. Is there an area of family life which you are overbearing or you tend to be too intense? Where you could just cool it a little bit. Where you don't exasperate. Second one is, is there an unhealthy wound of yours that you're tempted to deal with through your family? Something that you need to maybe personally work on, get help working on. So you don't be tempted to work it out on the people you love. And then third, is there an area of family life in which you could be more patient, where you could slow to the pace of your son, your spouse, your daughter, your friend, and walk alongside of them? These are really hard questions to wrestle with. I'll be praying for all of you as you do that this week. First, ask God for his grace and his forgiveness for you as you, as you talk about these, as you pray about these. And then let that grace and forgiveness that God showers you with just flow into every other relationship that you have. It's that simple and it's that profound. But be reminded of God's love for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray.